Hey everybody, this is the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast again, another episode. Today I have Jack Andreoni from Oakland, California, and he is a new beekeeper who is starting in a bit of an urban context, and we're also going to talk about some of his travels around the world, or at least around North and South America, uh, and some beekeeping experiences he got into, and uh, what actually got him into beekeeping. So, hang on for that. Where should we begin? Well, where would you like to begin? I know uh, you wanted to stop by here, and I was uh, broken. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. How are you feeling these days? I'm feeling much better. Um, <laughs> my ankle's <laughs> still aching quite a bit. I'm in a walking cast boot thing now. Oh, gosh. My back's quite a bit better. I can be up all day with a brace. And my sacrum is doesn't hardly give me any problems at all. Jeez, it sounds like you had quite a an accident there. That's yes, that's indeed. Tough. Oof. Unfortunately, I am not able to lift anything for another good while, so that kind of rules out beekeeping. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Gosh, but at least you can get back into the podcast. I mean, to hear mm-hmm. your voice, I listened to. Every single one of those podcasts that you uh, put out there. So I'm really excited to get a chance to talk with you. Awesome. Yeah. So I guess I could start just by telling you where I'm coming from, my my whole background with bees specifically. I, I live in Oakland, California. That's where I'm from. And this is my first year keeping my own bees. But my first contact with beekeeping was back in 2012. I uh, studied down in Chile in the university in Valparaiso, and I took a side trip with some students to a Mapuche indigenous community. And one of the people who lived there, Marisol, is an awesome beekeeper, and she hosted us for a few days, and we learned a lot about beekeeping putting foundation, melting wax, doing inspections. This was, this was during the spring there. You know, I, 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 we were looking for swarm cells and, uh, I saw my first Varroa mite and yeah, I got, I got my first, you know, a few stings. I remember this one poignant moment where I was getting really confident with my inspections, you know, ripping through the frames and this big cloud of bees just comes right at my face. And I kind of got a lesson there, you know, what well, you got to <laughs> take your time and listen to the bees and don't think that you are like the boss. So that was my first contact with bees. And then I kind of was interested in it, but I never came. I didn't come back to it for a few years. Um, and then in two years ago, I was invited by a few friends of mine from college and a friend of mine who's an artist in Cuba to collaborate on a film project. They got some money through the National Geographic Young Explorers grant to make a film about beekeeping in Cuba, specifically in the central region of Camagüey. So I went there, I think it was, yeah, in 2017 for our initial trip. And we met with a a few beekeepers. One of them was uh or still is a, a queen producer and the other one is a, a small beekeeper who runs kind of a, a biodynamic farm slash fruit forest where he collects different species of species of fruit trees and flowering plants so that his bees um have food year round cuba is an interesting place to learn about bees because there are no chemicals allowed at all in Cuba in their agricultural system or in their beekeeping operation. It's also a totally government controlled system. So to be a beekeeper in Cuba, even if you want to have one beehive, you have to go through a veterinarian and you have to become an associate of this big, basically government owned cooperative 
they sell you the equipment and you sell them the honey and you have to abide by all these guidelines you can't use any sort of chemicals all your honey is tested you have to switch the queens out every year and then all the queen breeders are controlled by the government and they're overseeing which queens are selected to be the breeder queens that are grafted off of it's very very strictly controlled um, so that was interesting for me because I obviously I just decided to be a part of this film and I didn't know that much about bees so that was my first trip down and then I went two other times where we really got in depth into uh, learning about beekeeping there. It was super fascinating. And then I came back here to the Bay Area and I got a job working with my family in construction. And um, that's when I started listening to your podcast because I would, uh, I would be on my feet all day doing things with my hands and it was kind of boring. So I wanted something to, to listen to and, and I wanted to listen to something that I was interested in. So I said, okay, beekeeping, I'll search beekeeping. And I didn't really find much that was that interesting. I listened to one po podcast with a bee culture magazine and then I found your podcast and I was like, okay, what is this about? I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I was kind of skeptical. I was like, okay, I know they're doing the, the chemical free thing in Cuba, but what is, uh, what is this whole deal about here? I was just, I was kind of like cautious. I didn't know if I was going to like it or if I was going to get into it. And I really got into it and it was really surprising to me. Um, and I got really interested in a lot of the interviews that you did with people doing alternative hive systems. The one with Les Crowder was super awesome. The swarm, the swarm trap one with Jason Bruns was awesome as well. And which other one? I'm blanking on the one, another one that I really loved. Uh, it'll come to me. But I just got really, really inspired, and spring was rapidly approaching. And around this time, I met a beekeeper here in Oakland. He's one of the best-known beekeepers. There's a lot of beekeepers here, but he's been doing this for a while. He came over from Yemen in the 80s, and he was beekeeping in Yemen since he was a little kid. And he came over here and started to do the same work. And he's my brother's neighbor. And I was walking my brother's dog. And we turn a corner and we're literally under a freeway. And there's this old church house on the right. And in the front yard, there are nuke boxes stacked up haphazardly and bees flying out. I'm like, oh, gosh, this is the guy I need to meet. So we've become really good friends. And I'm learning through him. I continue to learn through him. He has about 150 hives in different parts of the Bay Area. So we work together. And we also do extractions from buildings. So I was getting really inspired by my work with him and also listening to the podcasts. And, you know, I had all this pent-up energy and I just didn't know how to focus it. And then this light bulb hit me uh, one day when I was looking around this job site, there was all this wood that was being thrown in the garbage. I mean, if you know anything about construction, it's just disgusting the amount of waste there is of all this wonderful material. And so I took some of it home and I made myself a top bar box. Um, and I said, all right, I guess I'm going to try this out. And one day in Alameda, which is a neighborhood that's close to Oakland, uh, we got a call with Khaled to uh, do a trap out on a bee tree. It's this beautiful old tree that these people selfishly want to cut down, and this hive has probably been in there for like six years. They still haven't been able to trap it out because it's just so strong. And every time we would try and, and make like a mesh funnel to get these bees to leave this cavity, swarms of other bees who could that could smell the honey would just come and cling to to where the entrance is so that's how i got my first swarm and i put that in one of my homemade boxes and then the all of the spring and summer this year has just been kind of a whirlwind because i've just been doing all these extractions on my own and catching swarms and right now i have about 13 hives of my own that um 
And so I built a bunch of these top bar hives out of uh, this recycled material. And I um, experimented with doing partitions in hives. So I have multiple hives in one hive body. Uh, I took a queen rearing class in Davis, which was super awesome. So I tried my hand at a little bit of grafting too. Didn't have a ton of ex success, but um, I'm looking forward to next year uh, trying again because I really would love to get into the, to the queen side of things too. I don't know. I'm yeah. So right now I have my 13 hives. I'm excited because I haven't invested a lot of money into all this equipment. I've built it all myself and I haven't invested a lot of money into these bees either. You know, I've gotten them either from swarms or from extractions or from splits divides using some of the Queens that, uh, I, I grafted. So I'm excited to see who survives over the winter and, and yeah, keep going from there. So that's a little bit about what I've been doing. Um, yeah. Well, that sounds awesome, and so you you got a bit of this information from me and other places yeah. as well? I've kind of, since I'm doing this sort of alternative uh, route, you know, I don't have somebody who's like an expert on top bar hive beekeeping to be my, you know, teacher. I've kind of, I've read a lot of different books, I've listened to a lot of the uh, podcasts and um, I'm kind of learning as I'm going, you know, trying to figure things out. But uh, yeah, that's, I, I got a lot of information from, from your podcast and a lot of inspiration and, and, you know, ideas about, uh, about keeping bees. Cause I knew that I didn't have a bunch of money to, to invest in a big beekeeping operation. Although I was really excited about, about bees. I knew that I didn't want uh, chemicals to really be a part of, of what I do. It's just not something that I want to mess with. Uh, so I've taken a lot of what I've heard on your podcast and tried to apply it to what I'm doing. Yeah. Is, uh, is Oakland there considered Africanized territory? You know, um, I hear so. So I'm a part of the Alameda County Beekeepers Association email chains, and we there are hot hives that uh, people report and ask to be relocated and ask for advice about. But I don't think we get get a lot. But I'm not sure. I haven't personally had to deal with any bees that are super aggressive or Africanized seeming. Um, I went down, my brother lives in Arizona and I got a chance to go down to the bee lab there in Tucson. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. If anybody, uh, gets a chance to, to go to that lab, just walk in and the people there are super friendly and they gave us a tour and explained a lot of the research that they're doing. And they had all these really old looking pamphlets about, uh, Africanized bees and, and how to deal with them and how to identify them and stuff. So I have all that stuff saved. It's pretty interesting. In Cuba, the bees were super, super aggressive. I don't know if, if they were Africanized, but they just, I mean, and we didn't have any, uh, veils or anything because that type of stuff is so s scarce. It's hard to find. And so I was just wearing a long sleeve shirt and, and kind of a cowboy hat with some, some sort of mesh over my face. And I had the, I was doing sound recording. And if you watch the film, the sound is kind of spliced from different segments and amplified because recording the actual sound of the bees when we were doing the extraction was just impossible because the bees would keep stinging the microphone. So I know really <laughs> well what a sting sounds like, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they were super aggressive over there. Yeah, I've made a couple of videos from my trips down to Tucson, and um, yeah, it, it gets so loud. You know, I'm trying to talk to the camera, and you can't you can't hear what I'm saying, and people are complaining. <laughs> you need to put in captions. It's like I don't even know what I'm saying, so I can't do a lot. Yeah. So I'd say the the person that I wasn't remembering from from the 
from the podcast that I got the most inspiration was from was probably the Sam Comfort episode that you did. Mm -hmm. Super, super eye opening for me. It was like, okay, because as a new beekeeper, I was kind of like, ah, I have to know like the right way to do everything. Like I don't want to mess this up. Um, And then listening to him, I was kind of like, okay, maybe I should just go for it and like slap some things together and, try and figure this out you know Hmm. uh as i go you know i'm not going to become an expert um overnight no no matter how many books i read and you know so that was i I loved that episode as well sam's a favorite of mine because partially what what you say about his methods i mean he's just like yeah just throw it together make yourself something put bees in it and figure it out and i'm i'm totally into that type of learning you know trial by fire and and stuff like that and i think i think our culture is very much focused on or very much influenced by you know what i call the 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 amazon prime mentality where Mm -hmm. you can shop around and find the exact thing you want and have it show up at your house two days later for free Mm -hmm. um and with beekeeping, it's really not that way. You know, this is a, first of all, it's, it's a species of insects. They're, they're yeah. not, you know, they're not pets. Mm-hmm. They're not rabbits. They're not cows. You can't keep them in with a fence. They don't wear collars. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's a different sort of situation. And furthermore, they've been around a long, long time, longer than we have. Yeah. And, um, nobody, nobody taught beekeeping. I mean, you know, up until, up until not too long ago in the grand scheme of things, beekeeping was basically going out and chopping a tree down and stealing honey. Yeah. Um, you know, so I love his methods, especially with the, the new, what he calls the comfort hive, what we call the comfort hive. I wanted him to call it the anarchy hive, but whatever. <laughs> um, with, and I just posted some videos of him just recently uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, but the way he puts his hives together using just one by six rough sawn lumber, you know, he uses a piece of um, that reflective bubble wrap for an inner cover, um, just a basic bottom. He uses a, a 15 inch tile for a lid. You know, yeah. it's all held, to, you know, each box is held together with four screws or nails. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so simple and so cheap. And, you know, somebody like you that has access to a construction site or, you know, most of us have access to dumpsters if we can, if we can get over the smell. But, um, you know, that's, it's a way that I really feel like I think is the, the future of beekeeping. We've spent a hundred years developing this conventional beekeeping mindset, which has led us to, um, led us to throwing chemicals in hives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's given us a, um, a mindset of scarcity, you know, buying bees, which are essentially pre-programmed to die on us. Yeah. And, um, and we're, by we, I mean the royal we. We're so scared of losing our investment that, you know, we, <coughs> excuse me. We, uh, the people treat, you know, they treat, they treat bees like a medical condition. And the, the funny thing is, is those, those bees that they've spent so much money on and they're so scared of losing are pre-programmed to fail them. And it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a no win scenario. And I'd like to see people, um, as people are waking up to catching freebies, swarms, doing splits, all that sort of stuff so that when you do lose them, which they are going to die, eventually everything dies. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not upset about it because they were free and you have more and you can get more and it's not that big a deal. Exactly. And so, you know, for a while I was not really, I even had people get on my case because they would say, who are you following? And I'm like, I'm not following anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm doing experiments, I'm creating my own stuff, and I'm sharing it with people. I'm not following anyone. I'm not 
reading a book and then telling you about the book. I'm, I'm doing a thing and I'm telling you about the thing that I'm doing. Um, and then I sort of reconnected with Sam here, you know, in the past year and, um, I'm seeing his operation and it's the way, the way he does things and, and his whole attitude about things. And I'm like, this is a breath of fresh air. This is so much more, I think would be so much more enjoyable for most people who, um, who don't necessarily have a load of money to go buy Langstroth equipment, which is expensive for sure. Yeah. And don't have a load of money to go buy bees that are just going to die and then have to be replaced over and over and over again because they're junk. And so, you know, I think this, for the way I think, and I realize not everybody thinks the way I do. I mean, this is the way to have the most fun to do, to do this thing and enjoy it and not break the bank to do it. Mm -hmm. Totally. That's how I feel. And, I mean, it's been great. I've, I've really, I mean, this past summer has just, it's felt like an eternity in, in such a, such a good way. You know, I feel like when you're stuck in a routine of something in your work or in your life, it's just time kind of flies right by. And this, it's like every day with, you know, a swarm or an extraction that I'm doing or, or something else or an inspect, it's just, it's been so exciting. Yeah. And like you said, it's okay if, if, if one of my hives doesn't make it. I, ca- I caught this little grapefruit sized swarm, you know, is it going to make it? Probably not, but you know, might as well throw it in a box and see what happens. My first hive was so small and incredibly weak for so long. And I was just, I was just torn, upset. My first, swarm is just not making it the combs are super tiny they're not collecting enough honey and i was trying to move them to different places and now i've just kind of let them do their thing i said okay i'm basically because i'm too busy i just said okay all right we'll check on you guys in a few weeks and they've they're now my strongest hive you know they've filled up the entire huge box um so it just goes to to show you never know what's going to happen and and that's ex- the exciting part of it, you know. And it's just been so impressive to me um, doing extractions. What, just how fascinating it is the way that the the bees build, and just the incredible strength that some of these wild urban bee colonies have. I mean, I did the second swarm that I caught was out on 85th and East Oakland, which is kind of a rough, rougher area. It's like way out there. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's nice, but you know, it's not where you would think of, when you think of bees, you wouldn't, you don't picture them like thriving in that type of area. But I caught this huge swarm that came from some sort of building where they had, um, a hive living in there. I wasn't sure where. And then I got a call a couple months later from this lady. Oh yeah, we got a, a beehive in our wall I said, okay, I'll come take care of it. And it was an old house with plaster and lath on the inside. And I didn't want to mess with the outside shingles. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll deal with the, with, with it from the inside. And it was right before I was about to get on, get, go on a trip. So I was like, okay. I'll just come in. It's probably won't be that big of a deal. Just open the wall, uh, take some honeycombs out, bada bing, bada boom. I mean, that, thing was in between three stud bays and it was probably like 10 or 12 feet up like the entire wall was just a solid mass of honeycomb and then they stored all the honey on the right and on the right side in the stud bay and there's i mean there was well over 100 pounds plus of of honey stored in there it was just incredible and you know now these those genetics are here it's just it's just fascinating to me so I've enjoyed, I have one Langstroth hive. I work at a bee supply store and, you know, I, I sell bees and beekeeping equipment to all types of people. I mean, I had a guy come in as I want to get some bees to scare away my neighbors. so She won't steal <laughs> lemons off my tree, you know, you know, people who don't know much, they just want bees. And they said, okay, this is how much this costs, this is how much this costs, blah, blah, blah. And it just adds up and it's just, it makes me cringe a little bit. It's like, oh my gosh. 
And so I, I said, okay, I might as well try it. I might as well try um, having one Langstroth hive. So I have one Langstroth hive at a neighbor's house who has Lyme disease, and she does apitherapy. She stings herself three times a week, ten times on her spine, and swears that it's the only thing that has helped her with her disease. I think she's now tested negative for, for Lyme after a few months of treatment. And of course she has to keep doing this for years, but it's pretty incredible. But yeah, I just, now that I've gotten used to working with, with my own hives, I mean, there's a satisfaction of, of handling something that you've built with your own hands. Uh, however janky it is in certain ways. And then, uh, there's a satisfaction that's connected also to the extraction work where you see the bees building their comb in these spaces when, when I open these hives and just, and just marvel at, at these beautiful combs, you know, that I, I don't, I don't feel the same way with, with the Langstroth, but that's just because, you know, that's the, the top bar stuff is how I started. So, yeah. How do you harvest honey? I harvest the comb. I like comb honey. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So I just keep it the way it is. And I haven't tried to market it too much. I mean, I'm, I have been kind of conservative about the amount that I'm taking because all these hives are getting started for the first time this year. Um, and I just give it to, to friends and, and family and whatnot, but I just love comb honey. I just think it's amazing. And, uh, I love to share it with people. I work at, I work for this beekeeper I work for. I also work at this farmer's markets selling honey. So um, I try to get people hooked on how amazing it is to eat the honeycomb as it was made. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So you don't bottle anything? Not really, no. I've done a little bit of crushing and straining, but not, not a ton. Okay. I like, yeah, yesterday was my brother's birthday and I just, I took out a, a fresh frame of, of honey and just cut it up and had this golden stuff just sitting in the middle of the table for people to spoon little chunks off of, you know, that's how they would, that's how they did it in Cuba. You know, we'd be at the table. It's like, all right, I was sick, you know, some honey out of the hive and they just cut it. They used Langstroth hives, but they would just cut it right out of the frame. And, you know, I think they're probably doing foundation lists because, you know, of the lack of resources, you kind of just, have to deal with what you can get but you know we'd have fresh roasted coffee and fruit and this honey that was just like a tropical explosion in your on your tongue you know it was really awesome yeah sweet yeah speaking of uh of costs and stuff i think the most i think the the main yearly cost that i have is foundation mm. cuz i use I'd say probably 75% foundation frames just because I like to keep, um, they're just easier to take, easier to, to set it and forget it for me, especially with swarm, swarm, uh, traps. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, that's the big expense nowadays. I r really want to get into, um, Sam Comfort's hives, but I need to finish filling up all my equipment. And like you're talking about, you know, you lose a hive and it's, it's not that big a deal anymore. You know, this last year I lost one of my yards to what appeared to be a pesticide kill before winter started. And, you know, it was kind of a drag, but I had bees elsewhere and, um, and everything was fine and I know how to make more. So the, the only major issue is now I have all this empty comb. What am I going to do with all this empty comb so it doesn't get eaten by wax moths? And, yeah, totally. Um, I even it's, collected a bunch of honey off those dead hives and put it on put it on some other hives for storage. Yeah. And uh I still because I hurt myself I haven't been haven't gotten around to harvesting it, so I've got these three giant hives in my front yard that, that each have <laughs> probably two hundred, three hundred pounds of honey on them that they're just kinda holding it for me. So I guess maybe I'll have to wait till next year. Yeah, I hope that you get healed up here quick and you can get back at it. Yeah, and I have. Um, I've been trying to build up the uh, the splits that I made earlier this uh, 
this summer. I, I sort of took, um, Sam's sort of micro walk away split idea and tried it with some, uh, with my queen castles. So I put one frame of open brood in there and then one comb of honey, maybe one or one, anyway, combination of honey and pollen. And then I stuck all my, I stuck, I made six nukes that way and stuck them in the closet in the basement for three days and then took them out in the backyard. And, um, let's see, all of the medium ones survived and one out of the three deep ones survived and it worked pretty well. So they're out in the back now. They've, they've grown a little slowly. I'm still getting used to this new location. I just bought a house back in May, um, after, after moving around for about five years. So now I'm finally, I'm settled in a spot now, and this is my spot, and this is where my bees are now, and I'm here with them, and so I'm excited about where we're going to go, and I'm, I'm very interested to see how the, the nectar flows and things work around here, because I'm surrounded by irrigated farmland and pasture land, and, um, I'm sort of, uh, in sort of the L area between a river, the major river in our area and a side Creek. I'm sort of between those two. So there's plenty of water around. Um, but the place wasn't very taken care of. And so it's, it's been kind of interesting because as we've been watering the backyard, when we moved in, there was nothing growing, but just weed grasses. And now there's loads of, uh, loads of clover popping up out of nowhere. Awesome. That's great. And it gets pretty dry there in the summer, right? I mean, I was just there recently. Um, it seemed a little bit dry. Just yeah, like here. we generally don't have any rain between May and September. It started back yeah. raining now. We just had several straight days of rain, so it's back to being moist. Yeah. But yeah, it's during funny. the summer, there's no rain at all. Yeah. It's funny because I just had my first taste of Medford, Oregon honey today. Really? Because that's... I was up there, right? I was planning on visiting you. Then I had car troubles and I ended up spending the night with a a family friend just, you know, down the road a few miles and they had bees on their property and I met with the beekeeper there and he couldn't stop um, talking about how much honey apparently he was getting off of the hemp crops. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, but a friend of mine who had just gone up there to visit with that family brought me back a jar of, of his honey. So it was really good stuff. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I you mentioned that. And I was I just I don't know how that's possible since <laughs> cannabis and hemp don't have flowers. So yeah. they might be picking up pollen from somewhere, but but nobody's raising male plants so i doubt that's happening the thing that could be happening is because there's now so much more irrigated land because of because of the hemp the the you know the dirt between the rows uh, a lot of the fields have a lot of weeds and that that could definitely contribute to honey yeah for sure yeah i'm not, I'm not sure exactly how that would be possible either but he couldn't he couldn't shut up about it so well, whatever works, right? <laughs> exactly, whatever works. So uh, you mentioned queen castles. That's something that I tried. I built these uh, basically; they're equivalent to a ten frame box or ten bar box, and then I put in partitions in there so that I essentially, I think, I ended up with yeah four two bar hives, and I put disc entrances on on either side, on all sides of the box, you know, and I didn't get, uh, I wasn't super successful and I was a little disappointed. I think part of it or all of it was just like faulty design. The partitions I feel like could have been designed better to, to make sure that there was no, uh, communication at all. Um, it was kind of thrown together haphazardly, but yeah, in each, in each box I would put, you know, in each partition, I would put one queen cell after that I got after I grafted. And then most of the time, I'd only get one or two. 
that I would see uh, laying in there. So eventually I gave up and kind of just, uh, I don't know, I just took the partitions out and let them be their own individual hives and they're doing really well now. And so now I'm in uh, kind of a, it's not a conundrum, but I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to proceed. I um, I want to build more of these these boxes because I have all these bees and, and some of them are going to want to expand next year and I want to be ready. But I want to design something that's going to be as versatile as, as possible because I found it awesome with these longer hives, just like Les Crowder was saying, to have the partitions in there so that I can have two hives, potentially three hives in one box and there be no communication between between uh, each of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been great because sometimes I'll have a really strong hive and then I'll have just enough space in that same hive body to put another hive that's not doing as, as well. And um, potentially if, if I need to, those, Two could be combined at some point, at some point, and then I have this weaker hive with with a queen that's so doing well, but they, she just has less resources to work with. And in case I need an, a new queen at some point, you know what I mean. So right now I'm working on designing this this box that will be just a few inches longer than the one that I originally built to save lumber. Um, it'll be four feet long, and then. I'll use disc entrances both on the sides and on each of the faces so that I can choose to have or to not to have entrances in different parts of the hive body, depending on where the partitions are going to be set. Mm -hmm. So I want to have it be pretty versatile. Um, Just that sounds similar to a, uh, a 21 frame Langstroth box that I made that has um, four entrances, one on each end and then one on each side offset so that I can put dividers in and have four separate five frame nukes in there. Exactly. That's what I essentially want to do. My question for you was I had this epiphany because I'm trying to design the, the dividers and my boss, the guy that I work with, Khaled, he has this whole system where he makes these screen bottom boards that he can, so he can essentially stack one hive on top of another hive. They're separate hives, but there's a screen bottom board in between that's designed so that it can either be used for a five frame nuke box or for a 10 frame box. And so there's like, there's communication in terms of the smell, like the pheromone of the queen. So they're, the bees are all familiar. They, they all have the same scent. And so if need be, those those hives can be combined at any time or not. You know, that's his idea. And so I was trying to design these partitions, and I'm thinking, okay, how can I design this so that in an instant I can make it uh, fit my needs? So let's say I need a solid partition at one point so there's no communication. And let's say at a different point, I want there to be some sort of scent passing through, but I don't want any bees to crawl through. And let's say I want there to be a queen excluder so workers can go through, but, you know, the queen and obviously drones as well can't go through, but the workers can pass from one side to the other. I haven't experimented with that, but I've talked to beekeepers who have done that kind of stuff. So I was thinking, okay, what if I have a solid entrance, I mean a solid partition, and then I just put a disc entrance on the actual partition with the hole through it. Would there be enough uh, communication to make that even worthwhile? Meaning like if I turn the disc entrance on the partition for there to be some scent passing through, is would that be enough to make a difference that I could potentially combine those hives if, if need be? If I put turn the disc entrance to the queen excluder one with enough workers pass from either side uh, with just that small of an opening or would, would it be better for the whole entire partition basically to make partitions for each purpose you know to have a solid partition to have a screen partition if i want and then to have a queen excluder partition so that's what i'm kind of trying to decide between so would it work essentially to put a uh you know 
one of those disc entrance on entrances on a partition with a hole in there to have it be kind of multifunctioning. That's my idea. It's a good question. I, I've never tried it, so I can't give you a definitive answer. Yeah, I guess I just have to try it, and then yeah. I'll get back to you and see if it works. Well, that's one. That's one of the answers that I've been giving people a lot lately. <laughs> is try it. You know, it'll teach you the same. The same with with raising queens. Try it. It'll teach you. If if you try it enough, you will you will stumble upon things that work and things that don't work. And you know it's it's helpful sometimes to ask more experienced people's advice, but there's some things that just nobody's ever tried before, and yeah. uh, nobody will have tried it until you try it. Yeah, and it's it's encouraging to hear that because you know in my life I'm I'm 27 now and I've tried a lot of crazy stuff and I'm you know I'll get really into something and then you know I'll I won't get bored of it, but you know I'll, I'll lose interest and or I'll get discouraged because of something and then I'll move on to the next thing. And I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm tired of switching all the time. And I've, I feel really excited about, about bees and having this be a part of my life as long as I can, as long as I'm on this planet. Um, and I don't want to be discouraged. And so I had terrible success with my grafting. When I did the graft at the class up in Davis, I did really well. Um, I got, you know, almost all of my uh, graphs to take. But then when I got home, you know, it didn't work out that way. And I tried and I tried and I tried in, in different ways and it didn't work. And it's like from that point, how do you continue? Do you say, oh, man, I'm just not good at this. This doesn't work. This is too hard. Maybe if I had spent a bunch of money on like fancy equipment and stuff and, you know, and it's just like a total failure, but it's just, I have to look at it as part of a, of the first step in, in my learning process, you know? And yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think a bunch of equipment is necessary. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but um, one of the things that really helped me sort of get a handle on what I was doing was going and taking a look. Uh, Michael Bush on his website which is bushfarms.com slash bees. Um, he's got a, sort of a catalog of old, out-of-print uh, beekeeping books that he has brought back into print, but they're there on his website for free, and you can read them. And I forget the, the names of the books and the authors now, but um, these are these are queen-beating breeding books from you know, more than a hundred years ago. Um, and so those, those, these meth methods that were developed by these beekeepers in the absence of modern technology and information sharing. And so they can be very valuable in helping you to get the nuance because a lot of times with queen rearing, I find there's things that you find in books that tell you to do. And you're just like, I don't, know why I'm supposed to do this. Yeah. And you find through practice that it actually works or helps. And so, you know, there's, yeah, we, we tend to think of our, our universe right now as, as, as always acquiring information and never losing something because of, because of Google, because of YouTube. Mm -hmm. But really we have lost it's just a matter of finding it. It's still there. It's just a matter of finding it. And um, so in, in a lot of ways, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Exactly. Um, but at the same time, we are in a new era. We are, you know, they didn't have Varroa mites back in 1910 or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. It's a different, a different time, different equipment, some of the same equipment, um, but different mindset, different sort of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Husbandry, animal husbandry, yeah. sort of attitude that, that we don't really have as much today because we've been enamored with the, the sort of medical mindset, you know, take a pill for whatever ails you. Um, mm. but I think is personally, I think there's much more value in 
struggling with our problems and finding a way through through um through sharing and community and and helping one another along mm-hmm. totally totally speaking of that um community piece one of the things that coming from cuba um and not really knowing much about beekeeping culture here in the states and then going to uh you know an association meeting and talking to folks and and you know bringing up some of the ideas from your podcast some ideas about alternative hives there was just i was just really shocked about how much like very violent disagreement there was between <laughs> folks you know and it just was really offsetting and just off-putting and kind of like ah uh, um so i don't really know how what to th- think about that you know as a young person who's you know just getting started in this i I want, I want, I hope in the future and want to find a way for that not to be a thing, you know? I mean, we're all essentially doing the same thing. We all love bees. We, we have uh, our own methods. There are a million ways to do everything. Um, and I don't want to be, you know, heckled for the way I do things. And I don't want to heckle somebody else for doing th- things the way they do things, you know, everyone has their method. Um, and you know, you can learn a lot I've found from academics and professionals and people who have been doing this for, for a really long time. You can learn a lot from the hobbyists who's come up with some crazy homemade, uh, high ventilation thing. Like the guys at the beekeeping meetings come up with some of that stuff is super awesome. And you can learn a lot from, the guy in Cuba and Mexico and, and Senegal who's, you know, just getting by with what he or she has and uh, and and doing great work in, in, in their environment. So I don't know. I've talked a lot with my boss, Khaled al Magafi, the, the Yemeni guy, about this. Like, how could we create more of a community, even a global type of community that brings people together more in a constructive way? way that's that's a future that i would love to see you know um but i don't know how realistic that is yeah well like with everything it takes time you know when i started when i started the treatment treatment free beekeeping facebook group years ago i've said this many times i was only expecting a few hundred people you know and have a nice tight-knit community um but it's been successful beyond my wildest dreams you know we've got around 33,000 people in the group right now. And it's, uh, it's become a, you know, it's a, it's a job now just to keep track of everything and keep everything on topic. Um, so there is, and there is, there's definitely a shift toward what we're doing. You know, in the beginning, we were probably quite a bit more militant than we are now because we were under so much pressure and so much opposition yeah but now you know one of uh one of our moderators went to Epimondia this year sam was also there uh and a number of other um uh knowledgeable treatment free beekeeping speakers and and people and you know they had a whole treatment free beekeeping section this year mm-hmm. you know when is when has that ever happened before <laughs> You know, my, my prediction has been for years that eventually there won't be treatment free beekeeping anymore. It'll just be beekeeping. That's That's, what I, yeah. That's the goal because it's, it's not that we've, we've done something new or amazing. It's that we've just realized where, where we got off track and we, we backtracked and we found where we're supposed to be and, um, and a lot more people are doing that. So many people, you know, I'm probably among the oldest of millennials. Um, however you, however you define the yeah. generations. Um, but a lot of people in my generation are just, they're just not interested in that sort of factory farming mindset anymore. Yeah. Um, and I've been absolutely surprised looking at the analytics from, from the YouTube channel to find that our biggest, um, 
our biggest audience is people 18 to 24. And it just sort of tapers off from there as, as you get older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, but the difference you see at the beekeeping meetings, and I don't know if this is true in, in your area, but virtually everywhere I've been to the beekeeping meetings, the average age is 50, 55, 60, even it gets to be quite old. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. I I welcome everybody who's available. It's it's great. I think it's great to have um elders in in groups as much as young people, but you need young people in order to keep things alive and whatever is the next thing, the young people aren't really that interested in the traditional model, be it conventional beekeeping with treatments or you know the sort of um, association meeting model and um, conventions and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. There's a there's a shift happening there. So it's exciting. It's exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I mentioned to you briefly, and I think I I, I wrote a message to you or something about conversation that I ended up having. I went to Chicago for my grandfather's 90th birthday and he's always mentioned to me a friend of his that that he's had for his whole life who became obsessed with bees and, and became a beekeeper out in Illinois. And uh, I got a chance to get him on the phone. He's, I think he's kind of on his last legs. He's an older gentleman, but the stuff that he had to say you know, having lived through all of this was just, just very simple and eloquent. And, uh, I loved it. He basically in a nutshell, he, I think he's, he never has been a proponent of, of the use of chemicals, even though he was a beekeeper before and after Varroa hit. And he just talked to me a lot about his philosophies around beekeeping and really listening to what your bees are kind of saying to you and observing and, and kind of taking a step back from this idea of control over what's going on. And it was really refreshing and it's changed um, a lot of my, just how I approach an inspection. Like yesterday, for example, I went in and I said, okay, I got some free time. I'm running around. Why don't I go check on my bees? And, you know, I cracked the lid on, on one of my hives and there's, you know, it was a total disaster and I got stung a bunch of times. And I was like, <laughs> I felt like I was back at square one because I wasn't, you know, there it wasn't the right time. I wasn't listening to the circumstances. I had no real intentions there. Um, so I just had to take a step back. And there are other times when I'm more relaxed and I'm in the right mindset and and I feel more at, at harmony with what's going on and uh, I'm able to kind of better understand and be kind of a, a listener as opposed to like having a, this narrative running through my head about all the different problems and scenarios and possible solutions and this thing that I read in the book and that, and, you know, just kind of observing with all your senses and gathering information and then assessing what you need to do or, what you don't need to do. Isn't that what life is like? You're going through and everything is... <laughs> I'm still figuring that out. And I think that bees are helping me quite a bit. Yeah. You, some days everything just <laughs> seems to fall together. You know, you look out the window and or you're outside and you yeah. see just that it's a wonderful universe. And other days you fall on your face and you break your bones and you lose money and... You know, things happen. That's that's how yeah. life goes. We stick with it. Just keep um, it moving. Yeah. It, like I say, it will teach you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, before we close up, is there anything you think we should know that we haven't already talked about? Anything that we should know? Um, I don't know. I think we've... Anything you want to share that we haven't talked about? Um... Oh, uh, something that I'm really fascinated uh, with that I wanted to explore in the future when I was in Cuba. Uh, we had this whole side project that didn't get uh, turned into a film 
about uh, the stingless bees. Ah, in yes. Cuba. So in Cuba, after the triumph of the revolution, some of the soldiers that fought with Fidel Castro kind of were like, what the heck? This isn't what we what we envisioned, and they started to fight back against him. And they were pushed into the mountains pretty far up there. And, you know, they've just lived in these communities uh, in complete isolation since then in this government kind of militarized zone. And this specific community is called Community 23. And people in that community have learned how to uh, capture these wild melipona, the stingless bee colonies, and, uh, you know, harvest honey from from them. And they have all sorts of claims about the medicinal benefits of this other type of honey. So I'm really fascinated with this, you know, whole, I mean, obviously there are all sorts of different kinds of bees. I just got this awesome book that my friend Sam gave me, and I'm learning a lot about bumblebees and the solitary bees and, and different types of bees. But I don't know, there's something about Apis melipona that just really fascinates me. So in the future in my life, I want to definitely go back to Cuba and film this story. Uh, I want to go to Oaxaca and, and learn because they have some a more of industrialized uh, operations with, with this type of bee where they use little vacuums to suck the honey out of the pots and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and the, this spans down through Mexico, Central America, Colombia, Brazil. I mean, there are, I don't know how many different species, but there are a lot. And uh, this is something that I, in my in my wildest, you know, dreams, I want to continue to explore and learn about that stuff too. So I love it. Where can we, where can we see your, the movie you worked on? Uh, I'm still, we're still working with National Geographic to get, um, the all the media rights you know they technically have rights to the video and they haven't gotten back to us to be able to publicly post it it was up on youtube right uh for a long time and then we had to take it down the film is called biographies of beekeepers it's based uh the title is based off of uh my friend adrian who's a cuban's grandfather's uh essay a title of an essay that he wrote which is called the biography of a beekeeper his basically his memoirs as a beekeeper so we wanted to tell stories of, of these two beekeepers that we found in cuba so if you search biographies of beekeepers now you'll probably uh, find the trailer to the film that was made um the principal artist is his name is adrian cupelo diaz he's a super amazing video artist and an awesome person and hopefully soon we'll get the go ahead from uh from National Geographic and we can we can distribute it publish it publicly and uh sometimes I send out little private links to people who ask so that's an option too but maybe I'm not supposed to do that or say that <laughs> <laughs> Well I leave that up to you <laughs> Yeah but I guess if people get in contact with me through Facebook I don't use social media that much but I've been doing a little bit more uh I can send private links to folks and stuff. But hopefully, you know, the whole idea of filming bees and beekeeping and and it's many different forms and facets around the planet continues to be a thing that's a part of my life and just the world in general because it's such a cool platform to to understand things and to get these uh, really amazing stories told. So, yeah. So these are just a couple stories from Cuba uh, that from you know millions out there that still have to be told in the future so awesome if see. people want to get a hold of you what's the best way to do that um that's probably through facebook my my name's jack andrioni i don't have a website or anything like that maybe in the future i'll get things together and and we'll see i'm just like i said i'm just getting started i'm not an expert never will be always learning and always looking for new experiments, uh, new mistakes, new inspirations. So, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Thank you. 
it's been a pleasure to finally, you know, link up with you. I kind of sent you a message on a whim. Uh, it's surreal to be talking with you to this voice that <laughs> I play in my head for like 18 billion hours while I've do demolition work and construction sites and sweep floors. I mean, I really do appreciate a lot the work that, uh, that you put into the podcast. I don't use the Facebook page at all really, but the podcast is, it's awesome. And, uh, it's really probably the, one of the biggest, uh, probably I would say the, the reason why I, I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And I've found such a sense of fulfillment in what I'm doing right now. So thanks. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. Yeah. So keep it up, you know, even if you got a broken back, we still want, we still are looking for more. So <laughs> awesome. I have no plans to quit. And, well, uh, you. as you said, you know, if you send me an email, send me a message on Facebook, I pretty much answer everybody unless you're a jerk. So, <laughs> um, it's I'm not so famous that I I can't be gotten a hold of. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes say that I'm beekeeping famous, which means nobody's ever heard of me. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you so much and uh yeah, I'll be in touch in the future if I have any other questions about beekeeping or life or any other things. Thanks for listening to this episode. Hot tip for this episode is that I now have a merch store. So if you uh, want to support Treatment Free Beekeeping, the podcast, the YouTube, the uh, the Facebook page, and everything we do, uh, run over to parkerbees.myshopify.com and get you some merch. I've got some, uh, some various products, mostly t-shirts and things, some stickers like a mug. Um, proceeds all go to help support this operation, keep this stuff coming to you. And, uh, oh, by the way, if you're a patron, you get a big discount on that. And I now have patron rewards set up. So if you are a patron and you haven't checked your Patreon account lately, go over there, put your address in and get your free merch. Um, free things start at $2 and they get better and better as you uh as you give more per month pretty simple uh and if and above five dollars you get a big old like 30 percent discount so that's good too anyway go check that out uh thanks for listening i have been solomon i will talk to you next time